Ok? Eu mudo lá. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, let's continue our program. Now, in this afternoon, we'll have two more classes. First one is by Professor Marcos from WSU. And after him, we have a break, and then uh, Professor Casey Jong from University of Florida. So, Marcos, thanks for your uh, contribution, and let's go. Thank you, Nero. Let us just wait a couple of minutes so Nero can finish. So, for me, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, of course. Uh, I was a professor here for 10 years, so I kind of know almost every inch of this university still. Uh, so it's excellent to come back and give a talk. I think it's always a good opportunity to come back and see a lot of uh, familiar faces and friends. And still have a lot of parties to go, you know, to catch up. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about uh, room and microbiology for dairy cats. Um, so I'll just a little bit about me, uh, two slides, three slides. I'm from Brasilia, the capital. It's a beautiful city, so I don't have like a super dairy background. My grandpa had a, a beef farm in Goiás State, which is a big state, was a big farm. Uh, so I was always very, very much in love. And then I moved to Vissosa in 2001, 17 years old. It was a long journey. So I did all my studies here, and then I was a professor here for 20 years. I was responsible for the, our dairy farm for about eight years. It was a very good moment. Uh, and then, uh, more recently, I moved to Washington State University. I've been there since 2021, January 2021. Uh, since I started at WSU, I have not had the opportunity to run any project with cats yet. I, actually, I ran one project with cats, but it was not linked to microbiology. So most of the studies that I will show today are studies from when I was still here at UFE, okay? Okay, so the overview today, I'll start uh, with a brief overview uh, about the rumen microbiota, and then we're gonna talk about the, what affects the rumen microbiology, specifically in dairy calves, and how to interfere with rumen microbiology in dairy calves. I am not a microbiologist. I'm a dairy nutritionist, okay? I will talk a little bit of, uh, about microbiology, but my focus is a little more on the nutrition side and a little less on the microbiology side. Although I do have a lot of collaborations with excellent microbiologists, and they have helped me uh, quite a lot or, uh, during this journey. So how, f is it working? Oh, now they're all gonna sleep. Thanks, Amin. Um, so how, how's the development or the establishment of the, the rumen my, microbiology? So first, we start by feeding only liquid feed to the animal. And technically, that animal that is born should have like a more or less sterile uh, rumen environment. There's a lot of debate about it. If it is during that first hours or, is the, or if there is the colostrum that is transferring some bacteria into the rumen or not. Uh, we did have a project, we're still waiting for the results where we slaughter the animals before the first feeding. So we want to check what is the actual rumen uh, microbiology before any, anything happening with the animal. But we do know that regardless, the animal will ingest some liquid, some fluid. So probably there is a lot of uh, uh, microbiota there. Um, in, the animal is not technically sterile. Um, so you have the outflow of material from the rumen after born. Um, we don't know a lot about the, absorb uh, the absorptive ability of the tissue at that point. There is not a lot of absorption. Uh, the animal is very, in the first days, the first 10, 15 days, the animal is very inefficient and then the animal shifts towards like a very efficient animal, so the most efficient phase of the animal. So the first 10 to 15 days, you don't have a very efficient, it really looks like a, um, a growth curve. So the very moment, first days, absorptive tissues is very, uh, and only like it's starting phases. And then what I'm kind of gonna focus is the substrate available to the animal. 
So usually, if you shift that substrate, that shifts a lot. Room and microbiology, animal efficiency, and so forth. Okay, so what are these substrates? We're gonna feed them with milk. So this, the milk hopefully will be fermented in the room and then converted into acetate, propanate and butyrate. We have some other uh, VFAs as well, but most of the time, and that's more or less the proportion of how that impacts the rumen microbiology or the rumen development. So usually we focus on propanate and butyrate in calves. About 50% of all the propanate uh, that's produced inside the rumen, it is used by the rumen wall to grow. Okay, and about 90 to 95% of all the butyrate. And you can take a look here that grain also helps a lot with rumen development, especially because grain stimulate propanate production and then you stimulate uh, rumen development. And I, uh, I, I wanted to mention here hay and any scratch factors, such as sponge or any forage, they have very little to no effect on rumen uh, development. They would change the microbiology, they would change a lot of things, but they will not, the animal, most of the time the animal don't get a little better. We're gonna discuss this a little later in the, the presentation, but there's a lot of, um, Still today, a lot of debate about how important forage is for cats. There is a very nice group in Spain, uh, and they have very nice studies on how important forage is for cats. But if you go to most of the dairies around the world, we don't focus a lot on forage for cats. But again, we can discuss this a little later. Okay, so what do we have in the room? So we have basically uh, the most important representants for cellulitic bacteria is Fibrobacter and Rumnococcus, Alimilolytic bacteria, Prevotella and Bacterioids, Methanogenic bacteria, the Archaea, Methanobrevibacter is the most present in calves, and a lot of, of course, lat lactic acid producers, Lactobacillus is the most prevalent one. So just for you to remember, because I'll be talking about those names, and you should remember some of them, or at least hopefully you will. You can always raise your hand and ask. Okay, so as every professor, a lot of, a few concepts are important, okay? So when the calf is first born in the rumen, it's almost sterile. Uh, however, by day one, a large concentration of aerobic bacteria can be found in the rumen, as the calf starts to uh, dry feed intake and the substrate in the rumen changes, the population of bacteria shift towards anaerobes. And I will show you this today, okay? What else? Characterization of the uh, microbiota in the calf GI tract uh, has mostly been restricted to bacterial communities in the rumen and feces of young ruminants. There is very, impressively, there's very little research on the uh, development of the rumen microbia over time and the influence of diets or, uh, on those animals. Um, usually those animals are not super, super cheap. Uh, when you feed the animals, you want to grow those animals and seeing the impact in the first lactate, lactation. As a dairy nutrition, that's the, always the question. Did you follow up these animals up to the first lactation? No, that's always the question. So if you want to become a dairy nutritionist, think about it. Um, at birth, calves display an undeveloped rumen that eventually matures into fully functional rumen and is a result of solid feed intake and microbiology or microbial activity. So this is more or less what you see in the rumen. So in the first week of life, abomasum is 6% of the, the whole, like, four, uh, the stomach of the animal, and there is no absorption of VFA in the abomasum. So this is very important. And then two weeks of wage right after weaning, the animal, that shift towards 65% rumen. By maturity, you will have about 80% of the stomach is the rumen. And with this growth, there's a shift in the microbiology of those animals, okay? So what do we find there? Again, but, uh, so what is like the function of each one? So the archaea found there, basically removal of hydrogen and production of CH4. Of course, that's not their only. I'm kind of oversimplifying things here, but that's their main uh, objective there is to remove this, this H2. This is extremely important, and we're gonna discuss that a little later because there's a lot of debate about uh, acidosis in calves, okay? And there's a lot of contradiction in the literature, even the nutritionists. Some nutritionists believe that the calves don't get any acidosis at all, and there are some nutritionists that think they, have, they get it all the time. 
So bacteria, uh, there's different metabolic niches. And fungi, uh, degradation of fibrous material, mostly lignin. Uh, we know that the ones that degrade cellulose and hemicellulose is basically the bacteria as well. And we, you see some protozoa that is linked a lot with the renovation of uh, archaea and bacteria and are also linked to prevent some of that acidosis, especially in the adults. We don't know. I will not be talking about protozoa today, today because we basically don't have uh, a lot of knowledge about protozoa in calves. Uh, I, I did this presentation, not exactly this, I changed a little bit, but it was last year in a symposium in Ilario Mantovani, some of you know him. He, that, that was his first question. Marcus, did you look at protozoa? I said, no, I did not, and said, like, okay, we need this data. So I'm running a trial this, uh, a couple of months. We're gonna start a trial uh, at WSU with calves. And it's not exactly the same approach, but we will have, we'll have our animals at birth, 30 days and 60 days, and this time we will look at protozoa. Okay, I don't know why it is going on like automatically, sorry about it. So with one to two days of age, you see, so that is what we used to know, okay? So very old uh, citations here. One to two days, bacteria. Three to 14 days, archaea. Eight to 10 days, fungi and protozoa uh, after weaning. That was what we basically thought at first. But then recent work identified archaea and bacteria in the rumen within hours of birth, suggesting that initial colonization occurs or can occur even prior to calving. Okay, so let's go. What are the three main factors? Develop basically age. The GI tract region, we're gonna discuss some very interesting results and the pre-weaning diet. Of course, the diet affects a lot, okay? So different bacteria taxa were found to dominate each GI tract of the S calves age, so there's a huge shift, especially towards amylolytic bacteria. As the animal grow, the proportion of milk in the diet, even if you fix milk, you need to understand that the animal is growing, so the proportion of milk in the diet reduces even if you're fixing milk. Keep that in mind, because this is important. The animal is growing starter intake, so the proportion of milk is reducing, and then that means that the bacteria is shifting. And also the GI tract, so it, not only the rumen, the whole GI tract is shifting. Um, so what are the characteristics that we do believe? Uh, basically morphology, pH, so again, we're gonna talk about pH. A lot of secretions, passage rate, we're gonna talk about passage rate today as well. Physical structure and particle size, that same uh, uh, group in Spain, uh, they have been doing some very nice uh, studies with particle size, and they also, they, they will affect the, like the evolution of the jet tract. Okay, so let me try to guide you through this uh, little, uh, um, graphics here. So what you see here, uh, separated here, is the jejunum. That is seven days. Besides, you see some separation here in the jejunum. All the GI tract, they have more or less the same community. What you see here is rumen, jejunum, second and column. So you see rumen, small, and two portions of the large intestine. They're more or less the same community. Seven days, the animal already got the colostrum, the transition milk, and a couple of days of milk. And there was no shift in the bacteria community. That was very interesting to see. And for, for those who doesn't know, like the most recent studies I'm gonna show you later, the rate of passage on those animals is about like 33, 25 to 33%. Meaning that within three hours, gone. Everything that should be digested is already digested. The animal already defecated whatever it left, three hours. Seven days, there were several times to do that over and over and over again, and there was still the same, same community in the rumen, column, and sacum, exactly the same community. So age plays an important part here, and we don't know how to manipulate this yet. So here in the second figure here is 28 days. 28 days, you see a very clear separation in rumen, is this triangle here, these squares are jejunum, so small intestine, and then large, the two portions of large intestine. Actually, large intestine, so from 28 days, 49 and 63, 
more or less established. So within 28 days, you see more or less the microbiota already established in that animal. Okay? Um, we're going to study the consequence of this in a few minutes. Okay, now what I did is I separated, uh, I did the opposite. So we did exactly the same data, but now this is rumen, this is jejunum, this is secum, and this is colon. So if you take a look here, this is a little harder to see because the lights uh, make it harder to see, but you do see a little separation, but not a very clear separation within each community. You don't see like a very clear shift. Maybe the easiest one to see is this one. So this is seven days. This is 28 days, the, the circles. The triangles are 49 days and the 63 days. So you see that there is a, some sort of an evolution uh, here. Uh, you don't see quite a lot. So you, it, it kind of established after seven days and they stay there. Um, so it's something in between seven and 28 days. Well, now what we need to do, I don't know if the Aya Cook, which is your seal up, uh, will like us for that, but probably we'll have to do what? We have to slaughter those animals between seven days and 28 days to understand how is this shift in the process. Because it's very clear that at the moment they establish, at least during uh, the pre-weaning period, they kind of establish, besides the second, which was the one that was more clear. Uh, one additional uh, there's, uh, thought that I, I, I want you to have in mind is that seven days, basically milk. 28 days, basically milk. Those animals were milk re replacer, but the idea should be the same. Basically milk. There's barely any concentrate intake with 28 days. Probably 100 grams per day, 50 grams per day. Why the animals should be, those animals were drinking six kilos of milk per day and eating 100 grams. With uh, 49 days, those animals were basically eating more than a kilo of starter per day. And 63, those animals should be higher than like uh, 1,300, so 1,300 grams uh, of concentrate per day. So there's a huge shift in the concentrate intake in the diet, but you don't see that same clear shift in the rumen and jejunum mainly. Again, the large intestine, you do see some sort of a, a trend of shift with the diet, but the ones that we were expecting to see a more clear separation, we did not see it. So that's very interesting results. Okay, so um, uh, this one's not like really clear. I'm gonna skip because there's an explanation for that in the next slide. So in summary, what we do see is, we do see all of them early in life. We see bacterioids, uh, parabacterioids, paraprevotella, streptococcus, and then close to weaning, you do see a little more of the amylolytic bacteria because of that huge increase, but is, there's, there's still a lot of like gray areas, you know, there's still a lot of overlapping. And honestly, it makes sense. The only bacteria that really disappears towards 69 days are the lactobacillus, are the lactic acid bacteria. All the other bacteria are still there. So in the intestine, the same thing, you see a, a very clear increase or growth of amylolytic bacteria uh, and a decrease in lactobacillus and, and, and fecal uh, bacterium, basically because of the decrease of the milk intake. So there's a still a lot that we need to understand and unfortunate, unfortunately or fortunately, that's how research works. We do see something and then suddenly there's something in between explain or that should explain that shift that we don't know. Okay, so what about the diets? So how would the diet shift this one? So that was the first study that we run, and then we run a second study. Uh, so we do know that the diet is ex extremely important, right? So archaeobacteria and fungal tax are established in the rumen of seven days old regardless of the diet. So everything you see in an, every single thing you see in an adult animal is already there at seven days old. Of course, in a little different proportion, but it is already there. Seven days old, the animal have not uh, eaten any dry feed yet, zero. Those seven days animals were not being fed, started at seven days old. We started about 10 to 15. But all those bacteria, including like fiber bacteria, fungi to digest, cellulose, or not cellulose, lignin, and all those, 
they were, they were already there. Um, however, that the question is, what about if we change that? Can we make interventions? Can we start feeding, for instance, Leo flies or freeze dry rumen fluid to calves? Would that shift that, that intervention? So we first did the simple. We got a group of calves, we fed only milk. And a second group was milk plus starter. And what we saw is basically we see a lot of VFAs, uh, but a, a lot of lactic acid as well. Okay, that, and that makes sense. And there was very small amount of fungi communities. Okay, what happens when, if you add concentrate to that diet? You start to see a lot of taxa known to degrade readily fermentable carbo carbohydrates, basically sugars and starch, uh, depressing uh, those taxa reliant to milk components like lactose. We see uh, an increase in methanogens and the acetate propanate ratio increase as well. For the ones that are not nutritionists, which I think is the majority of the, the, the people here, usually when you feed uh, fiber, you increase acetate production. And when you feed um, uh, starch, you decrease this acetate to propanate. So you increase propanate production. Okay? So that's basically the a response to some fiber that has been digested in the concentrate. So when we compare all of them, it's not for you to read, but you can see all the 0 0.001 here. Basically, you shift everything but the fungi community. And that was also interesting. I don't think you can see, but all those, uh, but one, but all those fungi or most of the fungi were non-significant. And that was very interesting because we do have some lignin in starter concentrate. But it, it was not shift. It's, it's interesting. Because you feed only milk, and you feed milk plus solid dry feed, and the fungi community was not changed. Uh, so, again, it's very hard to see, but I'm going to highlight here this first graphic here. So here you have the methanogenic bacteria. You clearly see whatever you, ha you, you have here. First, so this is seven days, no concentrate. So the first bar is only milk. The second bar is milk plus concentrate.
So for those who are online, we had like a, uh, the energy was down for about 10 minutes. We had to do like a coffee break. And now you're not hungry anymore. You can pay attention to the lecture. Um, so what I was talking about, uh, uh, the difference between when you feed the animal with concentrate or not, right? So when you have first only milk, that was the first treatment here. It was, uh, I, I say milk, but it was milk replacement, okay? Because it was standardized. And then uh, on the archaea population, you see a huge shift here over time. So you, whatever you see in orange here uh, is archaea growing and, and uh, shifting the population of archaea if you feed only milk and if you uh, feed milk plus concentrate. The panels B, C, and D are bacteria. So although you do see some shift, it's not that present or that, uh, like, such a huge difference. Okay, and as I already mentioned, for fungi, what was interesting, what you see in red here is unclassified. So there's still a lot we don't know, we don't understand. Um, so there is a little shift, but look at this panel D here. There is a shift, there is a change, but not as much as the uh, uh, archaea bacteria. So we are, uh, it's, it's very impressive that if you feed concentrate, not only fiber, because we do know that archaea like the fiber, they digest fiber to produce methane. Uh, but you see, you do see a huge shift in this case for the archaea, not so much for the bacteria. You clearly see that there is no huge change in the microbial community if you feed milk or if you feed milk plus concentrate. And what is interesting in this is, uh, the same message that I just I started to talk with the message, say like the microbial population is there. It's there. It's all present, regardless if you're feeding concentrate or not. And you're continuously feeding milk, and it's not changing that much. It is changing, but not that much. Okay, so some discussion here. Microbial colonization is sequential, right? We talk about this uh, shift from one day to three days to 14 days, and then eight to 10, and protozoa. That is what was uh, known in the past. But the main microbial groups commonly found in the mature rumen are established in the first week of age. Okay. Uh, our model suggests that some bacteria and fungi established in the rumen early in life and utilize milk nutrients such as lactose, carbon, and energy source. That's the only explanation you can do. So all that bacteria that was believed that, well, we all believe that should use starch should use fiber, they're probably using something. Milk, there's no starch in milk, there's no fiber in milk, but the bacteria is there, okay? So that's very interesting. We still need to understand why is that happening or how we can shift that, but it's very interesting to see, okay? But obviously, milk-associated nutrients fail to explain presence of members from the methanosphera, for instance, in young calves, okay? Technically, they should obtain energy exclusively from uh, pectin. Milk has no pectin, but the bacteria is there. Okay? So that's more or less uh, uh, the same thing with the, the presence of the genus uh, succinatum, uh, which converts succinate to propionate as the sole energy yielding mechanism, or at least the non mechanism. That will come from a starch digestion. Again, the bacteria is there. There's no starch in the diet, but we did see the bacteria in a very good uh, presence. So again, for sure there are alternative pathways explaining the presence of those bacteria. Still a lot of uh, possibilities, still a lot of unknown uh, results that we need to um, investigate further to, um, to explain. Okay, so the last part of my presentation is more towards like nutrition. Okay, so how can we change the diet and how can we interfere with the rumen microbiome of those animals and how would that impact performance and health? So um, there's a lot of talks about like what we can do with calves. The industry has a bunch of uh, nutrients or a bunch of uh, additives that we can feed those calves. As I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, there's a lot of freeze-dried rumen, 
uh, and, and companies are even like isolating some rumen bacteria and then you can feed those animals with this isolated rumen bacteria. A lot of prebiotics, probiotics, essential oils, a lot of things. Okay, and we believe that this will shift the rumen microbiota. Okay, so there might be some opportunistic association between rumen in response to diet, mostly increasing abund abundance and diversity. So the bacteria is there, probably not changing, we're just changing the proportion of the, the bacteria. So the response in over calves depend on other factors, such as rumen development, host microbiome, microbiome interaction. The first question is, when should we start this intervention? Right after birth or during the transition? And the main reason for that is the more than 90% of the energy, and actually, I studied for my group, we showed that about, on average, 96% of the calf performance is basically explained by milk intake, by energy derived from milk. So there is very little opportunity to improve the performance of those animals during the pre-weaning phase. And if you think logically, technically, uh, post-weaning is more like, it makes more sense to start feeding those additives after weaning. Um, however, we have, we have to remember that we, uh, even if you do a very good colostrum procedures, you have a high passive immunity on those animals in the first 10 days, week of life, but there's a drop immunity around 15 to 20 days before the active immunity catch up. So there is always a period of low immunity on those animals around 10 to 20 days. So there is a lot of nutritionists saying like, if those uh, changes in the rumen microbiota will change the immune system of that animal, or at least will help fighting those bacteria or those undesired bacteria, uh, that might help you with those four or five percent difference in, in performance of some animals. So there's, the response basically is I don't know, we don't know yet. But uh, those are like the two justifications for doing or not doing that intervention early. Uh, one thing that uh, there, there has been some studies, and I, I am in contact with uh, uh, a Dutch company, and we are trying to establish a, there is some evidence, I think in pigs, showing that if you use, instead of using uh, milk protein in milk replacer, you start using plasma, either porcine plasma or what is the other one? I think mostly porcine plasma, you may improve health of those animals. Because I was just talking to my students, like the intestine, and the intestine use uh, amino acids as energy source. So what you do is you make the intestine healthier if you, sup if you uh, replace part of that milk uh, protein by porcine plasma, because you're gonna fe be feeding the immune system, the intestine immune system by that way. Um, however, the preliminary results we have is basically if you start feeding today, you gotta feed the whole thing. There's people saying like, there, there were re some research with freeze dry rumen uh, samples that you're gonna feed them like day one. Would that help the calf with like developing the rumen microbiota? Within a few days, the, all, all is lost. So you gotta feed every day. Do you guys think it's cheap? Freeze drying room and fluid, you gotta filter that thing and freeze dry. That's super expensive. So, uh, the results we have so far is yes, it is beneficial to feed those freeze dried room and fluids to the calves to the establishment of the room and microbia. Not only room, but intestine as well. However, you gotta feed it every day. And so far, is uh, like the cost prohibitive to, to use those uh, in calves. Maybe in the future. But with the technologies we have at this point, not yet. Um, so what we try to do, basically, we have it available besides a starter that we already know. There's a lot of pre probiotics and prebiotics and essential oil. And I have one slide about rumen transformation as well. But most of it is probiotics, prebiotics, and essential oils. As we're moving uh, away from monensin, we're moving away from any antibiotics and ionophores. We're using every day more prebiotics, probiotics, and essential oils, which kind of some people call them prebiotics as well. So there's a still debate on, among the nutritionists about, uh, about it. 
lot of debate about colostrum. I'm not focused on that. You do know that colostrum has bacteria that will influence the colonization of the, on the rumen. Water, of course. There's some evidence that like some ADF correlated bacteria, so fecal bacteria, um, it's uh, obtained through the water the animals drink, and they start their feet. So I'm not coming back to this because we already discussed uh, that. Um, probably you already saw this. This is a, a classic and famous Penn State pictures about rumen development when you feed only milk. That should be milk plus forage, and that's milk plus concentrate. So technically you should all know that what develops, what stimulates rumen development is starter intake, okay? So what about probiotics? Again, what I can tell you, uh, as we lost some time, I'll have to speed up a little bit. So what we know, even like between prebiotics and probiotics, most of the time is like, does that affect health? If yes, usually you get good results. If it doesn't affect health, usually it doesn't. Um, so it really depends on your farm, on your situation. Do you have a very good calf management? Do you get a lot of scars? What's the mortality at your farm? It's very low. Usually there's no, uh, well, we can always use that as an insurance, right? Can always do that. But that's most of the research, what they're saying. Um, so this is uh, a very interesting study because they fed the cats with lactic acid bacteria or yeast, okay? And the combination, so they have the control, yeast, lactic acid, and lactic acid plus yeast, so the interaction. And in all cases, you had a better results. Some of them were not different from the others, but you always have a little A here in the... So the more you feed, the more you get some responses. Again, depending on the challenge. Okay, if you have an excellent management, very like close to a sterile environment some, sometimes, you might not have the desired results. We use them as an insurance because we do know that usually management is very poor, at least in our situation in Washington State. Oh my God, it's terrible. Okay, management is very poor. Can you guys imagine you feeding 7,000 calves per day? There's no way you can do it well. Okay, it's too challenge. If you have 20 calves, there you go, go for it. If you have 7,000 calves, it's another story. Okay, so that's the cost you gotta pay for having like such a huge uh, facilities. Um, essential oils is the same thing. So the way essential oils uh, work is more or less the same way the ionophores work. Usually they work towards like fighting uh, some specific bacteria. So they, they either kill the bacteria or uh, inhibit the, the growth of some bacteria. Uh, and also what, what it does, and usually that is uh, methanogenics as well. So sometimes you might see, this was one study that I found, that you might see a little increase in propionate production and that will have some response in performance. But again, very contradictory result, results in the literature. This is one results from the literature, and this is the study that we ran, uh, and Nero was also involved in this study that we had control monensin, probiotics, essential oils, and the combination. So in the past uh, slide, I show you that the combination was very good. In this case, the combination was bad, and the probiotic was the best results with no difference between probiotics and essential oils. So when they were used separate, they were good. When they put it together, it was bad. We don't know how to explain that, but it was bad. So again, results are very, very contradictory still how they interact with each other and so forth. So we take a look at digestibility here. For some reason, digestibility was decreased when you use the probiotics and essential oils together, so, okay? So, and the probiotic, the only probiotic was the one with the better uh, fecal consistency, which means that they have a little better, we do have the microbiology of the, the, the fecal microbiology of those animals and the same results are shown that. Um, you have a better like gut health. That's the only indication we have in this study. But again, this study was one thing. The previous study that I'll show you, the combination of both was better. So, 
there's still a lot to learn on this matter, okay, for, for CAS. So regarding rumen transformation, so it's transferring rumen fluid from healthy animals to others. So that's technically the, we do that a lot in cows. When the cows have like acidosis and something like that, we get a healthy cow, remove the rumen fluid from that cow and uh, transfer to, uh, to the sick cow. Uh, in adult animals, uh, that we saw some good results, but overall, remember that study that I showed you, like you can feed animals with bacteria today. If you don't feed them every day, three or four days later, the animal back in its original condition. So, so far, rumen transformation is not a reality. Again, whenever we get some not cost prohibitive, uh, spray dry uh, rooming fluid, maybe might be an opportunity for those animals, but still very, very expensive. So, so lastly, I want to spend about like uh, five to seven minutes about this project. This is a project with my two PhD students that are here. And the, um, for us nutritionists, it's very interesting because we always uh, focus on calves are monogastrics. So we consider that all the protein we feed to those animals we will end up in the abomasum, be digested in the intestine, and be absorbed as proteins. Zero to no microbial protein. Although we do know that there's a lot of bacteria there, we didn't consider that as a, a considerable part of the protein nutrition of those animals. And there's a lot of indication that that doesn't happen, but nobody believes it. So, okay, as any researcher, a uh, strong-headed researcher, we go there and say like, okay, let us try to uh, test it. So we designed this study, and the problem with determining microbial protein production in calves is that the way we do it in adult animals is that we need to establish passage rate, we need to establish the rumen pool, and we need, this, we need to, so the, technically the multiplication of the rumen pool by the passage rate is your microbial protein production per day. And the endogenous fraction as well. But we don't know any of this in calves. So we designed a study to fur, and the calves is a little more complicated because we don't know how much milk is leaking from the esophageal groove. We don't know. People say that it's 5%, some people say there's 1%, some people say there's 10%. Okay, so we designed this study, so we put markers on the milk, we fed those animals and harvest those animals um, this many hours after uh, feeding. So we have the control uh, before feeding, we have right after feeding, we have half an hour, one hour, three hours, six hours, and 12, 12 hours, six kids per time point with low or high milk yield, uh, milk intake. First, interesting results. Those two graphics look exactly the same, but one is rumen and the other one is abomasum. So we fed that animal one liter, 455 show up in the rumen, 461 show up in the abomasum. Treatment two, we fed uh, half a liter, 200 ml show up in the rumen, 256 show up in the abomasum. Meaning that at least 40 to 45% of that milk is leaking into the rumen. And all the calf nutrition so far mentioned that 90 to 95% goes all the way to the abomasum. That was very, very interesting results at first, okay? Also, uh, we established the passage rate of those, and we also, so we use cobalt to, because cobalt is a classic marker for fluid phase, phase, liquid phase. So as we slaughter over time, again, you see a lot of variation. It's natural. Those are not the same animals, okay? We slaughter them over time, so those were different animals. But you do see a very clear trend in the abomasum, in the large intestine appearance, in the small intestine here, and the rumen. So with that, we establish the passage rates of each compartment. So now with how much milk is leaking to the rumen, with the rumen pool, because now we have the rumen pool, and now with the data from the passage rate, there's only one information left we need to determine microbial protein, which is how much bacteria is in that fluid. 
There's a problem because with the adult animal, you collect two liters of rumen fluid, you do a series of centrifugations to get a bacteria pellet. And that bacteria pellet tells us how much protein is in that rumen. We don't have two liters, we have 200 ml. So we need to establish a uh, methodology to determine microbial protein in very small quantities. So we're using PCR techniques to do that. Again, it's not a proven technique. We need to probably run a, a, a trial to validate that. But so far, in summary, what do we know is 55% of that milk is leaking into the rumen. 40% is showing up in the abomasum, and even 2.7% showing up in the small intestine. That's probably a random effect, right? An experimental error. It shouldn't show up in the small intestine. Probably some reflux or so. And those are the retention times. As I mentioned, about 3.5 hours, everything is gone from the rumen. So again, we're testing several methodologies to determine protein. The results I'm going to show you is the PCRs, the results we have so far. Um, so this is the high milk intake, 10 grams per day. And this is the low milk intake, 9 grams per day. So guys, when we balance a diet for calves, we consider that 100% of all the protein you feed in the calves is showing up as our UP, rumen undergradable protein, so real protein. In our case, the high milk intake, 28% was RDP, was degraded in the rumen and converted into microbial protein. It's a lot of protein. For the low milk intake, 41% show up as rumen degradable protein. So again, with this, we will change or should change at least the way we feed our animals. Now we don't need to think about only rumen undergradable protein anymore. There is quite a big amount of protein being produced in the rumen of a young calf. This were, those were 45 days. Those animals were harvested 45 days. Okay, so just a, a final review. The GI tract microbiota varies according to age, region, and diet. Microbial interventions are possible, and there are many tools that can be used, although a lot of contradictory results are found in the literature. And GI tract microbiota is crucial consideration for optimizing health and performance of neonatal ruminants. So with that, I would like to thank you, and sorry for the energy, and I will take, gladly take any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Marcos. Uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, Dijamel, want to talk one? Thank you, Nero. Uh, Marcos, th thanks a lot for this uh, nice presentation. I said, what's pity I didn't invite you to be part of the jury of one of PhD students I had last year. It was exactly in the topic because we were looking at the mycobiota more preci precisely in uh, ruminants and taking into account the, um, the regime and also the seasonality. This is just a comment. I'm not going to to ask a question on because the, uh, the data comes in the paper which is published in December. Please take a look at it and send, send me any feedback, and I would really appreciate. Nevertheless, I have a question which is related to the probiotic. You mentioned that probiotic uh, can be, could be an issue. But uh, what I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned other pro combination of, bio, uh, of lactic acid bacteria and essential oils. You mentioned also yeast. But uh, do you think really this is um, uh, a promising issue in animal uh, feed? Because when you select pro probiotic, it depends on the, on the origin and their, cap their capacity to be in, the, in such environment. Can you comment on that, please? Yeah. Um, so first, I would love to read the, the, the paper and give you like, like my suggestions. Um, so the results we have are usually depend, as you mentioned, it really depends on the challenge and on the uh, environmental challenge. Of course, in a trial, all the heifers or 
cast are technically submitted to the same challenge. Uh, and we have like a lot of other factors, such as colostrum and so forth and so on. Um, so for us, most of the nutritionists are suggesting probiotics uh, in the US, not necessarily because of that study. It's because for essential oils, uh, probiotics is just a little easier to see how that's working because this is the Saccharomyces cerevisia, right? That's mostly what they're feeding as probiotics. In the case of essential oils, there's a huge bunch of variation in that. Um, but uh, again, the, the how, how can I say, like the mode of action, it's something that basically what we have in terms of information is basically like the, you're, you're winning a competition inside the intestine. So you reduce E. coli, you reduce um, salmonella and other undesired bacteria. That's basically the information we have so far. Uh, I'm not sure if that was exactly what you meant, but that's most of what they are, have been arguing is this. Origin, the origin of yeah, the well, probiotics itself. And when you take them from one place and put them another place, it has to be some. It has to be a challenge. And just to conclude for me, uh, Saccharomyces that you mentioned, the um, cerevisiae, is maybe the the top because it's the most studied. But there are now uh, non Saccharomyces which are being emerging like uh, a new category of uh, pro pro probiotics. And you can find a lot in the in this uh, ecosystem. Yeah, we don't Here. have a lot of those in the U.S. Maybe in Europe you have more. Uh, not, not necessarily, but uh, I mean, uh, I think we will chat. There you go. Thank <laughs> okay, you. Thank you. Thank you, Jamel. I think Ricardo uh, had a question. Ricardo, want to talk? Oh, you're pointing. Any more comment? Any more question for Marcos? Okay, so Marcus, thanks again. Let's move on. Thanks, Marcus. It Thank was you so much. <laughs> okay, uh, let's continue then uh, the program. So I'd we'll like to invite Professor KC Jong from the University of Florida. KC. Thanks again for visiting us. One more time, I will change that. Sure. Yeah, while he's uh, changing to my slides, I would like to appreciate all of the committee members who invited me to come here. I'm truly, you know, gratefully enjoying my time here, uh, especially a lot of uh, eye-opening, you know, comments, especially uh, Luis from Texas A&M. I learned a lot. Also, Marcos, he just finished his talk. I'm going to talk about a little bit, you know, similar to what he has just said. So also Jamal's questions. So all of the, my work is very well related to all of the talks and a lot of interesting things. Okay, I came from uh, University of Florida uh, in the USA. So I have a joint appointment between uh, Animal Sciences and Emerging Pathogens Institute. My education background is microbiology, not animal sciences. You know, during my training, I didn't take any animal science related course, but I'm teaching in animal science for microbiology, also GI tract microbiology. So please understand that sometimes I may say very stupid comment about animals. Your understanding of animals is a million times better than mine. Okay, so I said I am enjoying my time here because I study to know. Okay, so if you guys have any questions during my talk, please raise your hand and disrupt me. Or you can say, shut up, you know, I have different opinion. Please, let's study together to understand better about our world filled with microorganisms. So today, I'm going to talk about first a microbiome, and then move to host genetics on shaping microbiota in animals and its effect on animal performance. And then I'd like to finish my talk by introducing uh, methane emissions by modulating microbiota. This is quite new, so most of the talk about this methane emissions is not published, but this talk is uh, already published, so you can find some of my papers if you want to study further. 
The first microbiome, you know, it has very beautiful, you know, horns. Uh, I'm not sure where, but probably uh, not South Korea, maybe it's Brazil. Uh, so, whenever I, give, whenever I have a chance to talk about microbiome, I cited this paper. I started my talk with this paper, you know, a kind of a pioneering paper published by Jeff Gordon's group at Washington University in St. Louis, not in Washington State University, where I did my postdoc in the Department of Molecular Microbiology. So whenever, actually, even including this paper, was you know, presented by one of the PhD students or postdocs, everybody in our department, not everybody, probably most of them were kind of laughing at this talk because molecular microbiologists, we do not believe until it is proven by genetical or biochemical methods. However, those people were so brave to talk about in front of molecular microbiologists saying, oh, these obese mice, they have more you know, bacteria, which is formicutes compared to lean mice. They have slightly less uh, formicutes. So then they made a stories. It was published in 2006, about 20 years ago. What they found is this. You know, from obese mice, they uh, found more formicutes and less formicutes in lean mice. But the difference is very subtle to me, about only 10% difference. Then they uh, you know, started to look at to measure the short-chain fatty acid in uh, CECOM. Obese mice, they have more, uh, more short-chain fatty acid compared to uh, lean mice. Uh, grown you know, conventionally, then also, but surprisingly, when they measured the energy in the feces, they had less energy in feces from obese mice because they said obese mice, they could absorb more energy to the body fat. And then this is the story why you know, this paper was published in Nature at the time. They used the germ-free mice. So they collected the feces from obese mice and then transplanted to germ-free mice, and germ-free mice become fat. So this is the not first one. Actually, they had you know, uh, other papers. They published some other papers, similar papers, but it was not in nature. So it was kind of surprising uh, at the time. Yes, we joked about this story, you know, like you guys. I was sitting in the band, uh, on the audience, and then, oh, this story never going to be you know, published, but it was published in nature. And everybody started to look again, again, better and more pay attention. Then, you know, a lot of scientists jump into, jump into this microbiome area. Now we know a lot about you know, 100 trillion microorganisms living in our body. Average people, about 10 trillion in cells. It's about 10 times more than your own cells. And microbiome at the time, still in many text, text, uh, textbooks says microbiome is genes of microorganisms, you know. They live in my body, you know, anywhere, any need. And microbiome, now we know that it has a lot of functions, uh, controlling you know, immunity, even controlling animal performance, also energy harvest, and now even uh, neuroendocrine you know, functions. At the time, everybody was laughing again, right? So how come microorganisms, they can control, control you know, my behavior? And uh, now we know that our microbiome genome complements our own set of genes, and some people consider as last organ. That is old uh, definition of microbiome. It was genes in microorganisms. But recently, you know, these people um, suggested a new definition of microbiome. Microbiome is microbiota, which are microorganisms, plus a theory of activities, including microbial structural elements, including peptide glycan, uh, lipid, proteins, polysaccharide, also even you know, mm, uh, metabolite in the uh, microbiome, so uh, micro, uh, yeah, m uh, metabolites. Uh, that includes some signaling molecules, so even toxins and so on, even some uh, signal molecules from the surrounding environment. Okay? So now, don't say microflora. Microflora is really old terminology that's totally wrong because it was made by a plant scientist. The flora means flower, right? Then microbiota, microbiome interchangeably you know, being used. So if you say microbiota, it's fine for microbiome, 
Also, you can say microbiome to microbiome, but however, from now on, you have to say microbiota, they are referring microorganisms. Microbiome is microbiota plus others, okay? Please say yes. <laughs> okay, so now our understanding of microbiome is even bigger. So we eat plant, fresh you know, produce. Uh, Valentina said that you know, some people like Brazil, where is Marcos? Marcos, he doesn't, uh, he actually he wash uh, apples, but many Americans, they do not wash apples. Therefore, microbiota they are taking from plant, from fruits are different. It is affecting also animals too. And this plant is also affected by soil microbiota or microbiome? Which one? It's microbiota, right? So some plants, you know, affected by, uh, they communicate with the soil microbiome all the time, also animals and humans directly, you know, kids around this, they can say, maybe sometimes they are grabbing soils and then they, you know, put into their mice. So, not mice, mouse. <laughs> so they're gonna have different microbiota compared to other students, other kids. So microbiota is keep changing, but at some point they have very similar microbiota composition. I didn't say microbiome, microbiota compositions. This is our understanding. And the role of microbiota is very well established. In the beginning, we said, oh, microbiota maybe happens in the GI tract. And then if they or is many studied energy harvest. And because in 2006, they discussed about obesity, maybe microbiota is affecting obesity. Then we realized all the time, microorganisms, microbiota communicate with hosts, host affecting host immunities because of the uh, peptide glycans, LPS, they induce uh, host immune systems, and the hosts, they produce AMPs. So, but not only that, and then we found more recently, circulatory systems affected also, bone marrow development you know, uh, is affected, and nowadays we believe my behavior is also affected by microbiome. So more recently, like LPS directly affect on behavior through the, uh, 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 central nervous systems. You know, sometimes blood brain barrier was affecting by, is affected by short-term barrier cities. Nowadays, microbiota, microbiome is very well understood. So if you have very well balanced microbiome, you will have very functional uh, Conditions, liver, you know, circular systems, also obesity, and uh, uh, malfunction is uh, very well affected. And then we could identify specific bacteria or specific microorganisms they are strongly associated, negatively or positively. So this is our understanding of the microbiota. And surprisingly, in 2020, Two, November, it was approved by FDA. This is the first FMT treatment approved by FDA. I thought it never happens because microbiota, microbiome is not pure, it cannot be defined. Therefore, we cannot use as a treatment options. However, FDA, they approved, is conditional. Uh, for key, uh, you know, people, individuals 18 years of age and older, if they have a recording uh, CDI, clostridium difficile infections, we give a healthy defined microbiota or microbiome to the patient. That is the first uh, FDA approval and I was very shocked. After that, we have many you know, uh, FMT treatment uh, in the pipeline. So I believe this uh, approval, you know, just open the gate, uh, open the door, and we see more and more approval that can be used for any human treatment. So compared to human uh, microbiome study advancement, animals a little bit behind, maybe a lot. So it happens all the time. So I like to, you know, introduce two studies. One was published in 2018, which is also they look at uh, FMT using Chinese native uh, breed, which is on uh, Hongjiang Mini HCM. Um, and this is LY, this is just commercial crossbred. But these guys are very resistant to diarrhea compared to LY. So what they did was they just collected healthy microbiota, microbiome uh, from these uh, pigs 
and then orally give to this LY. And then what they found was, so if they gave appropriate amount of microoffices to this LY, the instance rate was quite so significantly reduced compared to this is normal instance rate of the piglets, about 40%, and then it down to 10%, which is native uh, uh, pig breeders' uh, average instance rate, which is very comparable. And then what they did was, so then they found, after, this, after uh, FMT, they uh, tracked those animals for up to 11 days. And then they found these five bacteria. One of them is Lactobacillus gasseri, which is very famous. And then another one is Lactobacillus fermentary. And then they uh, fed individual bacteria to LY, and they could see reduced diarrhea instance. But at the same time, when they used the mixed one, they also it was very low. But the single one, single of uh, treatment, it was as good as this mixed one. So they started to look at Lactobacillus gasseri to understand how it happened. And then Lactobacillus gasseri is very famous. We knew that before this one produced bacteriocin, gasseriocin A. And when they deleted the gasseriocin A, the in, uh, instance rates went back to the uh, normal, the control groups, so they were sure this gasericin A is responsible for the enhanced uh, diarrhea. So wild type compared to wild type. So then they did a, lot, a bunch of molecular and cell biology work, and long story short, what they found is gasericin A bind to a KLT19, uh, reduced cyclic AMP. Reduced cyclic AMP suppressed uh, fluid secretion uh, related proteins, also activate a slu uh, fluid absorption of proteins, therefore, a, a diarrhea instance could you know, lower. Also, I'd like to you know, introduce another study. Um, published by Korean group. The reason why I picked this story is because I came from also originally South Korea, so I respected these groups work a lot. So what they did was very similar. So they used a Korean brown cattle. This is a Korean uh, uh, Koreana. That means it is just you know, grown in Korea, very well protected in South Korea. And they believe this car uh, uh, meat from this cow is one of the best, better than wagyu, they believe, okay. even though I don't believe. So what they did was very simple. They uh, collected very healthy uh, feces from healthy calves, and then they orally treated sick animals for just five times, which is here. Uh, first two weeks, they treated uh, newborn calves with diarrhea, and then they follow those animals by collecting uh, by looking at microbiota composition, also animal uh, growth performance. So it's not clear here, but this is control group, this antibiotic treatment group, this is FMT groups. On day zero, they I, I identified many calves with diarrhea, as you see here, Bristol score is so bad, and color is white and watery. But later, you know, some of the calves, they were self-treated and become normal uh, feces, but some of the animals, they still they have bad uh, morphology. Compared to antibiotic treatment, even though antibiotic treatment it was working, but many cases, the diarrhea instance was not um, restored to normal one. However, when they did FMT, most of the animals, most of the calves, they you know, shared a very normal uh, morphology of feces. And then they did a lot of microbiota analysis. Um, even when they treated these calves when they are very young, they could see different um, body weight. It was significant when they did FMT body weight was a higher than control or antibiotic treatment, and they could see more carcass weight when uh, the young calves re received a healthy uh, microbiome. Uh, no. And then they did a lot of uh, uh, microbiome analysis. They could see the differences, and then they identified some of the bacteria they uh, might be associated with this phenotype. So now, I would like to summarize you know, microbiome-related work. 
So the field of microbiome research has evolved rapidly over the past uh, few decades, especially last 20 years. Now we have a new definition of microbiome, which is both microbiota, community of microorganisms, and their theory of activity, like you know, structural elements, metabolites, signal molecules, and the, the surrounding environmental conditions are part of microbiome. So promising results from microbiome research has boosted the microbiome market, and the FDA approved the first uh, FMT treatment uh, for uh, Clostridium difficile infections, and especially agricultural products based on microbiome are one of the fastest growing sectors, and I strongly believe microbiome uh, research uh, can provide the solutions on many problems, such as animal disease treatment and even uh, climate changes. Now, I'll just lead you guys to my research area, which is looking at the microbiota sh shaping, you know, how gene host genetics affect on microbiota establishment and uh, its effect. So since I like, to, you know, since Michael's already presented, I like, to, you know, take advantage of his successor, not, not successor, fellow speakers. So he suggested that actually he showed that there are uh, multiple factors affecting our microbiota establishment, like environment, age, diet. Those are the most important ones. Yes, I agree. Like those guys are extreme factors. So animals, when newborn animals, they have now establish microbiota, but he said it maybe it takes about seven days to have a very well established microbiota in the lumen. Also diet, also antibiotics, also lifestyle effect on microbiota. And this study, this extreme factors are very well studied. There's no disagreement, okay? Everybody accepted that these guys are very important. However, some intrinsic factors like, you know, bacteria in amniotic fluid, also delivery procedures, whether you guys are born as uh, a natural labor or, you know, through the C-sections is quite different microbiota even on your skins. And breastfeeding, yes, obviously it is affecting the microbiota composition. However, this genetic background is very now well studied because of the difficulties of genetic background, because it's hard to do controlled experiment to understand microbiota establishment. So I decided to study genetic background, whether it is affecting a microbiota establishment. So based on this study, it was published in 2014. They, they used the twins. They recruited 416 different twins, and they found this. So monozygotic twins, compared to uh, these dizygotic uh, twins, they have less uh, diversity. So their microbiome are more similar compared to uh, dizygotic or compared to unrelated individuals, suggesting maybe host genetics are affecting on microbiota uh, establishment. And another study I liked is this. So published in 2016. So some people, they have uh, SNPs uh, in the lactase genes, the ACT genes. They have more bifidobacterium because they said that if there is a SNPs, like GG in this position, uh, I don't know what's the number of the, uh, of the loci, but if there's a GG type compared to AA or AG, which is wild type, I'm sorry, I cannot say wild types. And compared to, you know, majority of them, they have less stability in these lactase genes. So therefore, you know, microbiota is complementing the lack of protein stable, uh, stable proteins. So it is very well accepted. However, this st study published in 2018, again in Nature, they said different thing. So they said, oh, environmental factors dominate over host genetics in shaping human gut microbiota. They recruited about 1,000 people. They have different um, uh, uh, genetic uh, origins, ancestral origins. So they have seven different groups, and then they divided by serving Different groups. The first is um, so whether they have first relative or they have no relative, but they live in the same environment. 
So it makes sense, right? So when they you know, recruited them, they did a genetic studies to show all of the seven groups are distinctly separated. So genetically, they are not mixed. However, there is no separation in microbiota uh, structures, suggesting, oh, actually, there is no uh, host genetic effect uh, to shape the microbiota. Because when they look at that, so actually there is a significance in species level and genus level. If people live in the same house, they have more similar microbiota compared to my relatives. So, and then I shared this story with my uh, friend, his name is Volkomai, he's uh, in the same, plo same floor, and he's my uh, next door friend. He's also a human microbiome scientist, and he said he's a very uh, interesting guy. He was tracking his microbiota, his wife's microbiota, and his dog's microbiota last 10 years. That they collected the samples once a year. Surprisingly, he had more similarity with his dog, not to his wife. So, and then I joked with him, I teased him, what are you guys doing uh, after dinner? You know, do you guys share the room or not? Actually, obviously, yes, he shares, or shares his room with his dog, probably not, to with, not with his wife. He didn't say anything about that, okay? So, but I assume that he may not. Uh, share his room is with his wife. So that is the study, quite you know, contributional you know, uh, outcomes. So some people suggest that they host genetics effect on microbiota composition, and some paper they don't. Then uh, actually our study, it were, we designed this study back in 2017, uh, before the Nature public, uh, paper was published. So we thought maybe host genetics effect on the gut microbiota structure, and we I uh, had a goal to develop a bovine model with a graduated spectral homogenetic variation, and then we can evaluate the effect of genetic composition of the microbiota structure using the multi-breed Angus Brahman herd raised in the same environment or uh, with the same diet. So we wanted to uh, delete the value of variable of environment and diet. This is the worst decision I made <laughs> throughout my life because I didn't know how hard it is at that time. And I raised the questions, and my graduate student said yes, because she didn't have any idea, because she was the first year PhD student. So here in Florida, not here, there in Florida, we have two groups of animals. One is Angus, the other one is Brahma. So Angus, they grow fast. They give really good marbling scores. It gives us a prime cut. However, they are not tolerant to Florida environment, which is very similar here, hot and humid. Animals become very sick. However, Brahmins, we imported from India. They are very strong to heat stresses. But they also eat forages, very poor forages, and they are very good at digesting. However, their marbling score is really bad. Therefore, we do not sell, we do not see Brahman no, uh, ribeye or tenderloin our supermarket. But most of the meat, it becomes you know, ground beef. Is it true? <laughs> yes. So th th therefore, we, you know, you have Florida Animal Science, we st uh, established a multi-breed, uh, cross-breed uh, program back in 1983. So we are maintaining that clones every day, and we do cross-bred based on the pedigrees. So, to make babies, we use six different breed groups. Breed group one is many Angus. Breed group six is Brahman. Two is has more Brahman composition compared to breed one. Breed through, uh, breed group three, yes, more Brahman. Breed group four, more Brahman, and so on. So it's Brahman composition is gradually, uh, gradually increasing. And then we made this uh, dial uh, method to mate them. So sires from each uh, breed group were mated with uh, dams uh, to have a calf, and then we divided the calf based on this uh, breed composition and resulting in breed one to breed six. So we, it, it took about 10 months to have babies. Then we started to uh, collect, uh, look at the data so first way we did was, yes, we had to make sure that whether they have uh, even a, a gradually increasing Brahman composition. 
Uh, yes, they did. Also, we were trying to minimize the age effect. Therefore, we collected the calves that have very similar ages. So they were born when we first studied. This is the uh, three months old studies. We used to only um, have age over 70 days up to 120 days, I'm trying to synchronize as much as I can. Also, to remove the sex effect, we also are trying to balance 50-50%. Uh, so, and then we had uh, about 200 uh, newborn calves, babies, and then we look at the genetic relatedness by doing SMP analysis. We used a bovine chip SMP analysis, uh, 250K, and then we measured the genetic related, related, uh, relatedness. So surprisingly, breed group one and breed group six, is they are very well separated. I was really, really surprised because we made these uh, calves, maintained these calves uh, last 30 years based on the pedigree. Based on the Mendel's law, we made them. And then surprisingly, when you look at this, this is the first time we measured the SMPs and the genetic relatedness. Yes, we could see some of the guys, they were outliers. Out, except these guys, they were, they were very well you know, separated genetically. Therefore, we deleted these guys and then we used our studies, uh, these animals for our studies. Not only is uh, genetic relatedness, when we measure the weight gain, as you see here, we could see linear uh, correlations based on the breed composition. This is Angus, this is Brahma, you could see, you know, reduced the body weight, which is, makes sense because the Angus, they grow faster than Brahma. Also, you know, glucose content is, is, is kind of borderline of the significant, but we could see more uh, glucose in Brahma. And, uh, this one shows a very acid is also increasing in Brahmans, also IgG1 is decreasing in Brahmans. So all of the data supported that our you know, animals are really good, They're very well maintained, they are very well separated, and they are gradually different. So having different genetic composition. Then what I did was, what we did was, okay, after deleting those animals, we uh, employed 240 animals, and this is the groups, that have and bulls, and they have different uh, uh, genetic composition like this, and we collected the feces to understand the microbiota composition. Also, we drew blood to measure IgA, Ig1, I'm sorry, and then um, glucose and triglyceride to measure, and then we learn through the metagenomics. Here is the data, Shannon Index, you know, showing the diversity of the uh, microbiota. It is very similar throughout the micro, uh, throughout the brood groups. However, when you look at the microbiota structure, which is looking the, uh, based on the PCO analysis, we could see quite well separated microbiota structures, suggesting microbiota is affected by host genetics. And then we found specific microorganisms. I'm sorry, it's not clear enough to see that, but this is, you know, red means very uh, high, has a higher relative abundance compared to, uh, between the uh, breed groups. So breed group one, we had uh, more uh, archimensia or other uh, uh, fatty acid digesting bacteria, but in Brahmans, we could uh, identify more uh, bacteria They are good at digesting um, carbohydrates. So we could see clearly, and then also, you know, when the breed of Brahman composition goes up, this bacteria goes up, also these guys are, uh, you know, going down. And we picked two bacteria uh, confirmed using Q, uh, qPCR, which is consistent with our um, metagenomics data. And then those are the three months because we just look at uh, collected uh, micro uh, fecal samples from the rectum because we believed at the time, you know, uh, rumen is not well established in young calves. Therefore, uh, maybe looking at uh, uh, rectum sample is much more relevant because maybe you know those guys are involved in energy harvest. But based on the markers data, maybe I was wrong. But see what happened. Then what is, we decided was, okay, this is the pre-weaning, three months old, but we also studied the nine months old, uh, you know, post-weaning groups, but they live in the same pasture, same environment. And then after nine months, animals were sent to feed lot. At the time now, environment is completely switched, shifted. Also, diet is now changed to high concentrated diet, as you see here. Then this is the Shannon index. 
in three months old, we see quite diverse uh, channel in the you know, diverse microbiota composition between animals. So this is the 240 animals, so I believe this is pretty much true. However, when the animals are growing, you know, much watering, nine months, they, their diversity is increased. However, as you see here, the uh, better diversity is very similar. That means they are synchronized. That means they have more unique, uh, more, more you know, synchronized, more similar microbiota. So I suggest my definition is this. You know, three months old, they are not established yet because they are very diverse animal to animal. We see huge variance. However, once they become animals, uh, become nine months, microbiota structure is going to become very similar. I define this is establishment. This is not establishment, in, at least in the human gut. However, when we move the animals to feedlot, now this diversity, again, is very well separated because think about this way. Originally, you know, Bill Angus has been selected to digest well for the con, uh, high, high concentrated diet to convert Brahmins. So in these groups, we put you know, Brahmins and Angus. So Angus, they are very good at, but Brahmins are not well you know, adapted to digest high concentrated diet. Therefore, you know, microbiota in Brahma might be, might be compared to Angus, maybe they are not as good as anger. So therefore, maybe this is the reason why I have the even diverse. Once they synchronize the two, you know, for, uh, digest the forage, they now become more diverse. Make sense? <laughs> I have to come from all the time whenever I say something about animals to uh, Louise. So this is the microbiota structure. So no matter what, you know, I put animals on four, pasture, three months, nine months, 18 months, they have quite different, uh, you know, uh, different microbiota structures uh, between brood group, breed group. So therefore, we believe you know, microbiota composition. Also, microbiota structure is affected by host genetics significantly. And then what we did was, and then we started to look at, okay, if there is a case, are there specific bacteria? They are always, always associated with host genetics. And we found, you know, this is pre-winning, this is fattening, this is a post-winning stage, and we found these three bacteria. They are always associated with host genetics. And when we measure the heritability, yes, it's pretty high. But uh, most of, not most of, uh, at least half of the animals, they carry this one, this bacteria. So I believe these bacteria are probably very important, and these bacteria are known as um, uh, carbohydrate digest bacteria. So, Makes sense to me. And then when I look at the you know, microbiome micro, micro interactions, I quite see quite surprising data. Here, in three months old, I see more connections between bacteria, but still we have this bacteria, our herb bacteria. As I said, you know, three bacteria are always identified, and this is uh, Strella and Oxidospira. Uh, they are very important uh, cellulose digesting bacteria, and they are the herb, and we see a lot of connections. However, when they become nine months, even though we see more richness, now, bacterial bacteria interaction is limited compared to three months. And then when we moved them to feedlot, yes, we didn't see a lot of interactions. So, this is our conclusion of the microbiota composition. It's affected by host genetics. Now, next question is, so what? Does different microbiota composition or structure affect on animal performance? The answer is yes, based on this study. When you look at the weight gain, this is a pre-weaning, post-weaning, uh, fattening stage. At least uh, uh, pre-weaning and post-weaning, uh, I'm sorry, fattening stage, so animal weight gain and weight, uh, animal weight gain are associated with uh, host genetics. As you see here, they are less, but during the uh, post winning stage, nine months old, we do not see significant difference be, uh, between the host genetics. Also, IgG1 concentration is also the same as like this. So we could see significant differences in three months and 18 months of fattening stages, but not. So now, I wanted to know if this effect was, uh, or, uh, was affected by microbiota or not. So we calculated 
microbiability, which is looking at the portion of total phenotypic variance uh, explained by the microbiome. So about 10% of the phenotype was associated with directly microbiome. Okay, so I strongly believe microbiome is affected by host genetics. They change the animal performance. And then we identified specific bacteria at different stage uh, associated to weight gain in, uh, in immunity. We found multiple bacteria. They are critically important for these uh, phenotypes. And then we look at the SNPs uh, using Illumina 250K uh, gene chips, found a lot of uh, SNPs. And this is the Manhattan plot showing the most, uh, showing the important bacteria for uh, phenotypes or associated specific SNPs. And then we calculated the uh, uh, prevalence of these SNPs. And yes, we found it. But at this moment, we you know, couldn't uh, connect these SNPs, whether they are really associated with these phenotypes. And then also we look at more SNPs, uh, some genes in, uh, in mutant genes. There are many mutant genes, which is important for uh, epithelial immunity. Also, we found many SNPs. They are concentrated in breed group one. And we found, you know, low side, they are specifically associated with some uh, pathogenic bacteria. So therefore, you know, horse genetics are clearly associated, not all, at least a certain content they are associated with. And then his, this is kind of a summary. Also, we look at the uh, uh, G protein. They are also, you know, SNPs in G protein, they are important for short-chain fatty acid acceptance, uh, the uh, receptors. And between uh, Angus Brahman, they have different microbiota composition or structure at different stage. Therefore, also, also they have different uh, SNPs in these uh, short-chain fatty acceptance uh, receptors. Therefore, I believe all of the you know, factors are affecting on animal performance. And this is the summary. After almost you know, three years for data collecting, and after two years of data analysis, yes, we published in you know, multiple high-profile journals. Yes, very happy, but I can summarize in these two sentences. Yes, both intrinsic and extrinsic factors are affecting host genetics. Therefore, we believe host genetics uh, our microbiome compositions must be considered for genetic selections for any other researches, you know, animal disease or climate change, whatever. So this is uh, two uh, take home messages. Please take it to your home. Now, this study is a little bit different, but not different, quite different to previous studies. And this study, a previous study was funded by US AMR, you know, Cap Grant. Um, this study I'm going to tell is uh, funded by USDA uh, SAS Grant to Sustainable Agriculture Systems. We just started January this year. So about you know, mitigating methane emissions. Luis from Texas A&M said that, okay, cattle, uh, beef probably 2.9% or 3% are responsible for the um, uh, methane, not, not methane emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And 77% of 29 coming from our animals, cow care for operations because they are grazing on pastures. Okay? So, therefore, I think that's, that's the reason why USDA, they gave us this fund to study methane emissions. Yes, I would like to you know, just revisit what uh, Luis said on Monday. So, we are responsible for a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, and because, yes, methanogens, they have to reduce uh, hydrogen to survive, and they generate methane. But it is really hard to you know, remove, or remove or reduce methanogens because animals, they have developed, evolved to have very well-balanced uh, ecosystems in the rumor, which is a homeostasis. Once you uh, broke, uh, break the balance, it's going to become this biosis that causes disease, as I said in the uh, background or uh, uh, review slides. So it is really hard because now microbiota is very, very established in the, in the rumen. So if you disrupt one, the other will come up and it may give you side effects and so on. Therefore, when we design some of these kind of experiments, we have to be very careful because if you 
change one thing, you may get another one which is even worse. There are some studies already you know, uh, conducted to reduce methane emissions. One of them is very famous, uh, 3NOP studies published in, uh, I think, you know, PNAS. Also a nitrate work, also recently seaweed experiment uh, done by UC Davis teams. So none of the work, honestly, I believe not practical because if we stop 3NOP, they are going to produce more, 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 more methane. Also, in, based on the PNS you know, editorial uh, story, they said also bacteria, they will adapt to digest the 3NOP. Easily, they're gonna you know, catch up you know, some of the enzymes to break down 3NOP, especially seaweed. Animals, they hate the smells, and they do not eat it. Therefore, we're gonna have you know, less uh, weight gain. Also, nitrate uh, it is also you know, toxic. It may cause side effects. So, so none of the studies are very you know, practical, and producers may not accept it easily. Some of the studies like, you know, phage therapy might be, you know, suggested. However, I'm not sure whether they can be also, you know, practical because archaea, they don't, they have just a few phages in their genomes. So even if they find some phages, maybe it's not practical to use it for, to target specific methanogens. Therefore, we need some techniques that can be used with low cost. So, Oh, another way, alternative way, is probably uh, genetic selections. As I said in this study, in the previous study, host genetics affecting microbial composition, that include archaea, methanogens. Therefore, if there's some hosts we can develop having less methane emissions, maybe it's good. This is not, you know, is not, uh, it is very critical because we already know that animal to animals, they have variable methane emissions. Also, there are you know, rumor studies they found about uh, 1,100 genera, and about 10% of them are, I'm sorry, 20% of them are associated with host genetics. Therefore, we hypothesize that it is feasible to select animals that may emit less methane uh, without hampering other traits. This study is funded by FFAR. I'm not the copy. I'm not the PD. I'm the just copy of this grant. So we are targeting two different methods. One is uh, targeting um, specific methanogens in the rumen to reduce methane emissions. So the other study is looking for you know better animals without any losing uh, uh, average, uh, daily gain, uh, average daily gain, right, idea. <laughs> so that is our two work that we are doing right now. Now in our lab, what in this SAS grant, what you are doing is identifying target bacteria, identifying target methogen, methanogens using uh, machine learning analysis. Yes, Luis already mentioned about uh, machine, uh, the, the power of AI. It's so you know, powerful, and we can save a lot of time, energy, and effort. So my lab implemented machine learning programs or AI tools about three or four years ago during the COVID pandemic. Since you couldn't go to the farm, I asked my students, why don't you work on your desk developing some fancy tools, which is AI, because we started to use AI machine learning uh, starting in 2020 during pandemic. It was the perfect timing to implement the techniques. At the time also we had you know, some papers started to be published in high profile journals, including in many other journals. So one of them is this, you know, we look at this nature communication papers. They studied uh, human microbiota. And then they were trying to associate it with a specific human path or disease using some you know, machine learning programs. One of them is Random Forest, and then which is SVM model. Throughout these machine learning programs, they could classify. Some you know, people with this disease, they have this kind of microbiota structure, also microbiota composition. Now, in, you know, when they analyze their own microbiota, they can predict this person may have some kind of this disease in the future or in the near future. And then they identify top 50 bacteria. They are associated with strongly this kind of disease. Therefore, you know, we started to use our own data using these kind of machine learning programs. Yes, it was not easy because 
I don't know how to do coding. I don't know how to use you know, Python, other computer or computer languages. But my students, they have fresh brains. So she started actually using Jai. She is uh, now she just defended her PhD last Friday. She was very brave to jump into this area, like you know, blind lead blind, and sometimes it works. <laughs> And then we used our own data set. We collected for 18 months from calves. We collected from zero month, three months, six, nine, 12, 15, 18 months from 250 different animals. We have different stage of animals, different stage of microbiota. And then we used our own data set to train this machine learning algorithm. We used a random forest. And surprisingly, so all of the animal data set without any uh, predicting all of the microbiota were predicted as we collected. So since we knew the you know, collection times, yes, we coding them. Oh, this is this samples are collected day, uh, uh, month, uh, day zero, uh, uh, three months. And then this machine learning program you know, find it by themselves, by itself. Uh, yeah, we, and then the accuracy level was surprisingly high. 100%. This is kind of not normal, but anyway, you could see, you know, 100% accuracy. So we believe, okay, this machine learning algorithm maybe it is a really powerful, you know, tools that we can predict microbiota that might be associated with methane emissions. And then, since we didn't have any data collected for methane emission work, we used other people's data. Sorry, I steal this data, but since it is published, there's no problem to use their data. Like Luis said, I don't have to collect my own data. I used other people's data published. They did nitrate treatment. And if you look at here, you know, when they look at the methane emissions collected by DMI, they could see significant reduced methane emissions compared to control groups. And then they also you know, reported raw sequencing data, and this is their PCOA analysis data uh, looking at the microbiota structures, but as you see here, it is messy. So there's no way to separate this uh, microbiota structure was from control or nat uh, natural treatment or combinations. However, when we used this Exactly same data set, and then reanalyzing using machine learning, we could see very well separated. And then, except one out of 19 were very well uh, predicted, you know, each of these microbiota was collected from control groups or nitrate you know, treatment groups. Yes, as Luis said, we do not know how this machine learning could classify or predict exactly, but Based on this information, we compared the responsible associated bacteria. They suggested these four bacteria, uh, two bacteria and two archaea, they are important for methane emissions. Uh, two of them are methano, uh, methano vector, also methanospira. We knew these archaea are very important to methane emissions. But this is the outcome of machine learning data. We have now, okay, including all four, it was uh, predicted before based on the static analysis. Yes, we got all four. On top of that, we got more than that. So suggesting we have now more target to you know, uh, tackle these methane emissions. So I'm not sure whether this is true or not because I don't know how machine learning you know, uh, selected these guys, but now our job is bring it to, uh, this to the lab and validate one by one whether they are really important before we move to the next step. Yes, this is the summary of my third lessons. Yes, is it possible to reduce methane emissions by modulating our microbiota? I believe yes. A CH4, high concentration CH4 become less by if we do, you know, uh, appropriately using all of these kind of, you know, cutting edge technologies, maybe we have a chance to tackle it down. With that, I'd like to summarize, you know, today's talk after spending more than 10 years. Yes, host genetic uh, factors affecting microbiota composition. Maybe we have a chance to tackle all of the problems. Uh, including animal disease or even climate change. Let's see what happens. Thank you very much. 
Oh, before I forget it. I'm sorry, I forgot. I forgot to acknowledge my team members. Also, Ricardo, he was in my lab as a vigilance scholar last year. Also, he contributed a lot for other projects, not directly to his work. Especially, I'd like to thank you to Passion Fan. She did about six years of host genetics work, collecting a lot of fecal samples, analyzing them. Now, she's an assistant professor at Mississippi State University. Yes, with today, I would like to conclude. Thanks a lot, Casey. Uh, we have time for some, for some questions. Someone would like to ask something to Casey or to add something? Hey, Jordan. Hello. Hey. Uh, so, Professor, uh, thanks for your lecture. It was very enlightening. And uh, nowadays we know that uh, some chronic conditions such as Crohn's disease, uh, uh, lactose intolerance are related to the microbiome. And uh, other diseases such as diarrhea is more related to a dysbiosis or uh, more than a biosis, the presence of a pathogenic bacteria. So uh, my question is, do you think you are looking the wrong direction considering the a pharmaceutical treatment and not considering the microbiome as a, a, a pivotal point in this, in this <laughs> chain. And second, do you think the microbiome research has the potential to become a product, in not just a, 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 a academic research field, but a private product to, to you, you use in, in other conditions for human health, for animal health, for animal production, and uh, basically this, do you think it is a product or more related to? Yeah, of course, my answer is of course, yes. Microbiome has huge potential um, to boost up in agricultural economics. We can save a lot of animals uh, by treating animal disease, even including climate change, I believe. Okay. Any more questions? Any more comments? Time Hello. to go home. <laughs> Everyone's tired. Okay, then, so, okay, I yeah, mean. Thanks. Thank you very much, Casey. It was a very nice talk. I just have a quick question about, like, the host genetics you mentioned. Um, but I was also wondering whether the calf microbiota would have some similarities with the maternal gut microbiota. Did you check? Uh, we did. Um, so actually, the first paper published in 2020, yes, yeah, so we look at where does uh, calf's microbiota is associated with a mom's microbiota versus dad's microbiota. Surprisingly, they have more association with Dead, not mom. So this is beef cattle, you know, not dairy cattle. So maybe that's the one reason. Casey, I think it was a very good presentation. Thank you. I think my question is this. It's, um, can you give us an, uh, some information about why is it taking too long to understand microbiome, and uh, was, what is it going to take? What type of technology and time, time, time-wise? How long is it going to take for us to really understand this? Or this is, <laughs> or this is just, just something else that is um, thrown out there? Yeah, sure. And then it stays there for some a fad, and then it disappears. Sure. Uh, even though I presented with very high confidence, I do not believe my work is perfectly right. There are a lot of caveats still because we use the 16S rather than, you know, uh, shotgun. That is one caveat because we amplified it. So I have to admit that. However, what I'm trying to say is, compared to old rumor microbiologists, 
at that time, they didn't have really good techniques to isolate you know, pure microorganisms. And their definition was, once they isolate, they just use different substrate, cellulose, you know, glucose, and so on. They started to group those bacteria. And then they are trying to overestimate about the rumor microbiota, microbiome uh, composition at that time. So we believed at that time because that was the technology we had. But now, with new information, new, new technology, yes, we are kind of now modifying, updating. But 10 years later, they may say, oh, Casey Jones' publication is sucks. We have to withdraw because of the, most of the data are probably wrong because we use limited information, limited technology. However, without this effort, yes, we cannot do it. Maybe I am putting you know, stepping stones at this moment, but 10 years later or 20 years later when I retire, at least I can say, yes, I spent about 10 years to understand microbiota, and I say, oh, it was not a total waste of my time. But I am expecting, you know, maybe five years later when we have a better understanding of machine learning or uh, using better technologies, I may have a completely different opinion, but I am ready to accept that. I'm not sleeping. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Okay, so KC, thanks a lot. It yeah. was a pleasure. See you tomorrow morning again. Tomorrow morning, yes. <laughs> Uh, so we will finish by today. Today was the longest, uh, was lo a little longer than the other ones, but tomorrow we will return with three classes. We start at 8 and 30 sharp, and KC will be the first speaker. And tomorrow morning, I think the topic is antimicrobial resistance, if I'm not completely wrong. So I think this would be, uh, again, another topic of interest of a lot of people, okay? So thank you who is online. I also thank you for uh, following us until now and see you tomorrow. <laughs>